They released hundreds of them in the middle of the desert and left. Once nearly wiped off the face of North America, tons of bison were set free by the U.S. government in a place no one thought they could survive. The place wasn't green, nor was it lush. It was mostly dry, rugged, and isolated. Biologists said it was a gamble. Locals said it was a joke. Some even called it a slow-motion slaughter. But the truth shocked everyone. Ten years later, that same desert is almost unrecognizable. Not because the bison disappeared, but because they brought something back. I'm not talking about animals surviving. I'm talking about a landscape coming back to life and proving nearly everyone wrong. It's hard to overstate just how broken the American prairie once was. Over a century ago, 30 to 60 million bison roamed this continent, but by the early 1900s, fewer than 1,000 were left alive. Yes, that's not a numerical error, unfortunately. From millions to barely hundreds, and almost all of them locked behind fences. That's why, in 2014, when conservationists announced they were moving over 250 bison to a remote patch of high desert in the Great Plains, it felt wrong. Not just controversial, but backward. There was no traditional prairie out there. Just wind-swept sandstone, sparse grass, and barely enough water for deer. But they did it anyway. And then the bison vanished. I remember reading about the plan back in 2014 and thinking, really, bison in the desert? It sounded like someone had mixed up the GPS coordinates. Anyway, they didn't die. As a matter of fact, they didn't behave like anyone expected. Collars showed them moving in strange seasonal patterns. Instead of staying in lowland meadows, they wandered into uphill grazing areas with barely any vegetation. They were adapting, just not in ways researchers anticipated. There were no fences, no feeders, and no backup plans. All they had was bison and the land. It was the boldest attempt at wild America anyone had tried in decades, yet not everyone was cheering it on. Why? Because the plan itself sounded like something out of a grad student's thesis project not an actual U.S. wildlife policy. The project itself was spearheaded by the Division of Wildlife Resources, backed by the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM. Their goal? Create a self-sustaining bison herd that would help restore native ecosystems, even if the terrain didn't fit the traditional image of a prairie. You'd expect rolling grasslands, but what they got instead was sagebrush, red rock, and brutal winters but ecologists saw potential. This land hadn't been overgrazed like most U.S. rangelands. It was remote, untouched in places, and held traces of what the land might have looked like before cattle took over. The idea was radical, but rooted in science. Let bison be bison, free roaming, migratory, and wild. No supplementary feeding, no forced breeding, and no roundups unless absolutely necessary. To those involved, it was a moonshot, a chance to test if bison, after nearly going extinct, could still play their original role as ecosystem engineers. These animals weren't just big grazers, they shaped the land. Their hooves broke up soil, their grazing patterns created natural fire breaks, and their wallows formed shallow pools that helped water infiltrate the ground. If the bison thrived, the land could too. But that's the thing, this wasn't Yellowstone. This was the high desert. To the average onlooker, the whole thing looked like a setup for failure. Ranchers weren't thrilled either. They worried about competition for grazing rights, disease transmission, and herd control. There were fears that once these bison were loose, no one would be able to manage them. One wrong winter, and they'd die. One wrong summer, and they'd starve. And then the finger pointing would begin. Still, the project launched. No grand press conference and no ribbon cutting just a convoy of trailers, a few wary biologists, and one of the boldest conservation experiments in modern American history. But what followed, no one could have predicted, because from the moment the trailers rolled out, critics were sharpening their knives. The conservation team had the science, but everyone else had their doubts. Locals called it naive, ranchers called it reckless, and even some biologists, quietly, off the record, admitted they didn't expect the herd to last more than a few seasons. They're prairie animals, one rancher told a Salt Lake City journalist in 2015, you don't drop buffalo in the desert and expect anything but bones. The Henry Mountains weren't forgiving terrain, with elevations ranging from 6,000 to over 11,000 feet, 
The area could go from scorching in the summer to buried in snow by early fall. And the vegetation? Patchy and sparse, not the rolling fields of tall grass bison were known to graze in. Then there were the politics. Bison were controversial animals, seen by some as national treasures, by others as oversized pests. Their comeback threatened grazing leases, raised concerns about brucellosis, and sparked debates about land use rights. Some saw the reintroduction not as restoration, but as a symbolic middle finger to the cattle industry. So people waited, not actively rooting for disaster, but not doing much to support it either. The herd was tracked, yes, but there was no fanfare, no bison cam, no tourism bump, just 250 animals trying to find their place in a dry, rocky expanse no one thought they belonged in. For a while, the silence felt ominous. Population counts came in flat, birth rates were low, and the few reports that trickled out painted a picture of bison wandering off course, struggling to find consistent grazing zones. Behind closed doors, some called for the plug to be pulled. Quietly, of course. No one wanted to admit they didn't believe in native species recovery, but they weren't donating, they weren't promoting, and they certainly weren't expecting results. But nature doesn't move on our timeline. As year one turned into year five, something strange started happening. It wasn't dramatic, not headline-worthy, but subtle. Green patches in old grazing corridors could be seen. More birds were seen in places that hadn't hosted them in decades. Soil started holding moisture just a little longer after rain. They were small signs, almost easy to miss, but the bison weren't failing, they were working. For almost 10 years, the herd barely made headlines. No viral photos and no national news segments. Just bison, out there in the desert, doing what bison do, grazing, moving, vanishing into canyons, reappearing weeks later near water holes no one had mapped. And all the while, scientists kept watching quietly and cautiously, waiting for the moment things would fall apart. But it didn't. Instead of collapsing, the herd grew, slowly but steadily, from 250 to 300, then 350. By year seven, the estimate passed 400. These weren't numbers pulled from wishful thinking. This was hard data collected by drones, field biologists, and GPS collaring. Somehow, against the odds, the bison were thriving. And then came the ripple effects. Plants began growing back, not just grasses, but native forbs and flowers that hadn't been seen in the region in decades. The bison weren't just eating, they were disturbing the soil, loosening it up, and breaking hard crusts with their hooves. Seeds could take root, water could sink in. Their wallows, shallow depressions where they rolled in the dirt, became catch basins for rainwater. Little micro wetlands. With new plant life came insects. With insects came birds. And with birds came the attention of ecologists who had written off the landscape as too far gone. The public was still mostly unaware. There was no big announcement. No government video declaring the project a success. Just a few reports buried in agency websites. Academic papers quietly citing unexpected prairie restoration and biologists in North America passing each other knowing glances in field offices. Even some of the original skeptics started to pay attention. Ranchers who once feared land degradation were noticing more resilient pastures on adjacent lands. Hunters reported healthier elk and deer in the same range. Some even started calling the bison ecosystem janitors, a compliment no one would have predicted a decade earlier. All of this unfolded slowly, almost invisibly, like a forest growing back after a fire. Nothing dramatic or fast, though it was happening. When the 10-year mark finally arrived, it wasn't a celebration. It was a realization. The desert wasn't dying. It was coming back to life. Everyone who had doubted returned with a simple question. Did it work? The answer wasn't just yes. It was yes, and then some. They could all see it. The herd had more than doubled, but that wasn't the headline. The real shock came from the land itself. Satellite imagery showed it clearly. Areas once considered semi-barren were now teeming with plant diversity. Grass cover had increased by more than 40% in some sectors. Seasonal wildflowers had returned. Insect populations had rebounded. Birds that hadn't been recorded in the area in over 30 years were nesting again. And perhaps most surprising of all, streams that used to dry up every summer were now holding water longer into the season. The bison weren't just surviving. They were engineering a comeback. Unlike cattle, which tend to overgraze and linger in one spot. Bison roam constantly. That roaming behavior distributes pressure on the land, giving plants time to recover. Their hooves break up compacted soil. Their waste returns nutrients to the ground, and their movements open up seed beds, allowing new growth to take hold. 
What researchers saw after 10 years was exactly what early ecologists had always theorized. Only this time, it wasn't a theory. It was proof. It forced people to rethink what they believed about wilderness. Because the truth was, this desert was never meant to be empty. It had been waiting waiting for the return of the species that once kept it alive. The Henry Mountains were never meant to look like Yellowstone. But with the bison back, they were becoming something just as powerful. A high desert prairie shaped by time, weather, and wild animals doing exactly what they were built to do. Even former critics had to acknowledge it. Some ranchers who once protested the project were now supporting cooperative land sharing programs. Wildlife corridors were being expanded. Conservation groups pointed to the project as a blueprint a bold, low-intervention approach that actually worked. And the best part? It didn't require endless human interference. No artificial irrigation, no hand seeding. All that was needed was bison and patience. In the end, what happened wasn't magic. It was nature, finally given the chance to do its job, and oh, how it did exceedingly well. No one expected a desert to teach the country how to bring nature back. Yet that's exactly what happened. The success of the Henry Mountains Bison Project didn't just surprise scientists. It rewrote the playbook for what conservation could look like in the U.S. Almost overnight, land managers and ecologists began revisiting long-dismissed ideas. If a self-managed herd could restore a degraded ecosystem in one of the harshest environments in the West, what else was possible? Could other animals, elk, pronghorn, wolves, play a similar role in rebuilding balance where humans had broken it? The idea of rewilding had always been considered radical. Now, it was being taken seriously. States like Colorado and New Mexico began exploring similar introductions. Tribes across the Great Plains, already decades into their own bison restoration efforts, gained new allies and attention. The narrative was shifting. Bison weren't just symbols of the past. They were tools for the future. Even in the political arena, attitudes softened. The same ranchers who once protested the release were now attending public meetings to learn how to coexist with the herd. Some signed land use agreements that allowed for shared grazing zones. Others joined soil health initiatives, inspired by the ecological ripple effects they witnessed firsthand. Who would have known that by year 10, bison wouldn't just be a herd, they would be a movement? Students studied them. Documentaries were made. Scientists cited the project as a model of low-cost, high-impact ecological restoration. And most importantly, the land, once written off as a lost cause, was quietly thriving. But perhaps the most shocking part? None of it required a massive budget. There were no advanced technologies, no helicopters dropping seed pods, and no endless interventions. The transformation happened because people stepped back, reintroduced a keystone species, and let the ecosystem remember how to function. And to be honest, it changed the way I think about conservation. Sometimes, the best thing we can do is stop trying to control everything and just let nature remember who it is. In a world racing to fix climate damage with bigger, newer solutions, the bison experiment offered something ancient and surprisingly simple, a return to what already worked. So yes, the US released hundreds of bison into the desert, but what happened 10 years later wasn't a failure. It was a lesson, one that we humans are still just beginning to learn. What's your take? Was this experiment brilliant, lucky, or both? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this video.